Hey, how's it going? I'm Dr. Anton Robleski. This is the Rockorama, and this is a whole bunch of core that I've got laid out in preparation of a field trip I'm going to be doing in just a couple of days. And we're ending back here at the University of Wyoming to look through some of these awesome, beautiful rock core samples that we've got from formations in the state. This is actually from out by Rock Springs, Wyoming. I You know, a lot of geoscientists don't really get a chance to learn how to look through core, what you're looking for in core, or even the basics of just kind of which way is up and which way is down. So I thought I'd take a few minutes today, just kind of give you a virtual core tour through this. Um, if you're interested, stick around. We're going to dive right into it. The most important thing, uh, if you're unboxing core by yourself, is to make sure the lids of the box stay directly below the box. That way there's no confusion as to which lid goes with which box. There's no bigger pain in the butt than being uncertain which box goes with which lid when you're pulling them off the shelf and getting the wrong box. The next most important thing is to make sure that the depths are lined up. So here's depth 236, 243, 243, 251. And I've actually arranged them so that they go deepest to shallowest. Now, if you're a driller, you like looking from the top down. So you'll read it like a book going from left to right. So here's the top of the core. It goes to the bottom here. Then this bottom connects with that top. And that top goes down to this bottom and so on and so forth. If you're a stratigrapher like myself, you'll want to go from bottom to top because that's how the rocks are deposited. One layer at a time. Boom, boom, boom. So you start at the base of the core, 257. Go up, up, up. 249, 248, and so on. Oh, that's 251, not at 7. Never mind. Okay, so we've got the basics of the setup out of the way. Box lids are where they need to be. Top of the box goes to the bottom of the box, which goes to the next top, and it's all systematic. I've been in core labs where they've put the boxes opposite this. So they go bottom on the left the top of the right. And the problem with that is just when you're getting a groove going on describing core, here's the top, here's the bottom, you go to the next one over, and it's flipped on you, it's reversed. So you've got the top of that one is not correlative with the bottom of this one. Very confusing. Just think it through before you lay them out. Let's take a look at the actual rocks now and see what they tell us. Because I'm a stratigrapher, I'm going to start at the bottom, work my way up. We're going to move pretty quickly through here. we got a lot of rock, and I don't want to take too much time. But we can see really interesting features already, like the slumped and contorted bedding. Now, this is very fine-grained mud and silt. There's obviously a lot of contortion. And looky here, there's a burrow. This is a burrow that almost looks like a little onion, and that's something called asterosoma. It's a feeding trace made by some sort of invertebrate organism, maybe a polychaete worm. And it's going through this stratification. You can see it's interrupted. So here's the light color material is sand, very fine grained sand. The darker color material is mud um, and silt. It's penetrating that, interrupting the bedding. The bedding normally would have been straight across like that. So anywhere you start seeing little light color material like that, those are burrows that are filled in with sand. It was a little organism burrowing in the mud, left its hole open, and when sand came moving through during the next pulse of sedimentation, the sand filled in the burrows. So that's something we'll be keeping an eye on. Now this is what we would call heterolithic. It's mud and silt, mud and silt, and then some sand beds. So we've got the sandwiching of dark and light material indicating differential energy, low energy for the dark, high energy for the sand. So we're seeing something that's got on and off energy systems. The burrowing, the lack of roots, and that fine lamination suggests that it's standing water. The burrowing also suggests it's probably not a lake, because um, not a lot of lake deposits have burrows. Some do, some have mayflies and caddisflies and whatnot. There's a lot of burrowing things that are complicated, like asterosoma, tend to be more associated with marine waters, brackish waters, saline waters. The fact there's not a lot of burrowing suggests that this is not open marine, and we'll get to that later on. So we've got heterolithic deposits, and then look at this, nice homogeneous dark, and then some really dark sparkly material. That sparkly material is organic. That's carbon. That's holy fragments. Then there's an abrupt transition to some sand. And that sand is very, very burrowed. You can see all these little burrows. There's one. Here's some. And these are a combination of burrows called paleophycus, planolites, 
Um, they've all got a name, and that's not really important for us right now. What it's telling us is there's a lot of organisms burrowing in the sand. So from a depositional environment standpoint, we're going from an environment that's kind of high and low energy underwater to sort of low energy with some coaly material, and then whack, there's an angled cut, and it's filled with sand. We'll get to the interpretation in a second, because like I say, we've got a lot of coral. Let's just keep working our way up. That sand caps out with, oh my goodness, more coal. That is some nice looking coal. And check it out, there's even roots coming down from the coal. These are actually root casts. These are root fossils from plants that were growing up here and penetrated down in. That tells us something important. And again, we'll save the interpretation for afterwards. We always want to do description, save interpretation for after. From the coal, we get back in some muddy, silty sand material. It's got a little bit of burrowing. And oh, wow, look at that. Shelly material, lots of shells. These are bivalve shells. All of a sudden, there with a big, sharp, scoured surface. And then we get back into our friends, the heterolithic. So we're starting to see repetition. We've got heterolithic, carbonaceous shale, sand, carbonaceous shale, coal, carbonaceous shale, heterolithics, shell, heterolithics. So you start to see patterns. And then we've got some bioturbated, in other words, burrowed mud with some silt. You can't really see any depositional bedding in here. It's been all chewed up by the little burrowing animals. So they used to be bedding, something like that, but it's now been completely churned by the activity of little animals. And you can especially see that up in this interval where you can actually still see the burrows preserved. Which, not surprisingly, goes from carbonaceous shale into sand. And this sand has organic material, which is giving us that kind of sideritic iron staining. There's some internal scours and lots of shells, more shells. That's interesting. So the sandstone has a lot of shells in it, and that just continues up until we start getting in some more carbonaceous material. So the shelly material gives way to carbonaceous material, and that starts getting more and more abundant up here. Again, we're going bottom to top. Carbonaceous drapes on the sand. This is bedding. So this is what's called cross bedding. In other words, bedding is just the layering of the deposits, and this is cutting crosswise. It's cross bedding. Shells, carbonaceous shale. In fact, this whole box is pretty much the same. It's shells, carbonaceous shale, and sand. It's cross bedded. Likewise, up to here, same thing. And things change again here. So here's our carbonaceous material with the sand, and whack, we're back into the dark colored mudstone with some silt and some sand. It's burrowed up. You don't really see that nice bedding like we saw down below. And the burrows here show up in the sand really nicely. Nice big burrows the size of my finger. Um, probably made by shrimp or worms. It's something called thalassinoides. You can see them here too. Incidentally, if you've seen these holes throughout the core, they're all over. Um, like that one, that one. That's where plugs have been taken for analysis for porosity, permeability, flow, and that sort of thing. More bioturbated sand, bioturbated sand, and ooh, sharp surface, very clean sand. Look at this stuff. Not much in the way of burrows, but you see that cross bedding. Cross bedding is still present. Cross bedded sand. What's this? You start seeing more of those shapes. There's cross bedded clean sand. It's kind of monotonous, actually. In fact, these next couple of boxes are very similar. Check this out in the cross bed of sand. Here are some burrows with little nodules around them. Burrows with nodules. That's Ophiomorpha. That's made by a modern day ghost shrimp. You can go see these things on the beaches and estuaries of modern coasts anywhere, uh, temperate and tropical. And we'll get to the top here and say that's the end of our core. Boom. Again, that clean sand cross bedded with some Ophiomorpha. What does it all mean? That was a lot to get through. Uh, and normally you do this over the space of an hour, a couple of hours. Nobody wants to watch that on YouTube. I don't even want to make it right now because I'm going to be doing it in a couple of days with a group. So I've zipped through it, shown you the changes in lithology. We've focused on the changes in color. There's burrowing in some areas, not so much burrowing in the others. Um, different types of burrowing. We've got shell in some areas and no shell in others. What does it all mean? 
Let's interpret it now. This is the fun part. This is what everybody likes. Interpreting core requires use of analogs. In other words, we're looking for modern environments that produce similar fabrics of rock. And we're in luck because we have a, a large number of analogs to choose from. Deposits like this are very common in deltas. There's fresh water, there's marine water. It keeps the animals off balance. There's not a lot of burrowing. We've got some animals that are happy, but it's not completely chewed up. So we've got a lot of fresh water running off the delta. It brings sediments. Um, it brings storm outwash, just like is happening in the Texas coast right now. And the delta front, which is the subaqueous part of the delta, the underwater part of the delta, looks a lot like this. There's other areas of the world that can look something similar to this, but generally deltaic systems really strongly resemble this. So I'm going to go ahead and interpret that as a delta. And that makes sense if you think about it, because on a delta, you've got the bays and the lagoons which then have swamps on top of them. And sure enough, here's the coal and carbonaceous shale, which represents the swamp on top of the delta, just like in Louisiana. If you're a Cajun or you like Cajun food, you know this type of environment. The scour is another thing. It suggests some sort of channelization, some sort of cut into the coal swamp, which means probably this delta lobe had subsided. And we're seeing that right now in the Mississippi where everything is kind of compacting because this mud had a lot of water in it when it was initially deposited. And over time, under its own weight, that mud compacts and squeezes and brings that swamp down, which creates a flooding surface. That flooding surface is then prone to be incised when there's big storms by tidal channels, uh, distributary channels, and those would naturally be filled with sand. And in that sand would be lots of worms, crabs, and shrimp, making all these nice little burrows. You see them here, these nice little vertical burrows, probably made by little worms and shrimp. We've also got a lot of larger burrows. Look at this, you can see this one right there. It's faint, but there it is. Um, again, here's another one comes down, penetrates through that sand. So typical of a little tidal creek or tidal channel, which of course, after it gets filled in by sand would have a coal swamp on top. So we've got two little successions of deltaic, what we call progradation. There's one below, then it compacted, switched over, built up, Coal, of course, compacts to a ratio of like something like eight or 10 to one. So this peat would have originally been something like, if we say that's about, I don't know, 30 centimeters, might've been something like three meters thick. So 10 feet. Uh, right now it's about, you know, one foot, maybe a foot and a half thick. So about a 10 to one compaction ratio, which of course would have resulted in flooding of that delta. And sure enough, here's flooding deposits, more of that lagoon or bay. Here's an interesting one though. We've got something different and that's the shelly material. The shelly material is very typical of little storm uh, wash channels or tidal inlets. And tidal inlets tend to really focus energy on systems like this, little tidal creeks. If you've walked along tidal creeks on the coast, they've always got a shell lag at the base and it's incised into what might've been a bay or a tidal flat. So this is typical of a little tidal creek base and then it's filled in with heterolithic material that's really burrowed quite a lot. Because again, in tidal creeks, there's a lot of energy, a lot of flow, a lot of oxygen. So that means a lot of happy organisms that would have chewed up the sediment. That tidal creek or tidal delta or whatever it was filled in with more sand before another channel came through. And here's another scour with a lot of shells. And that shelly sand, which continues on for, oh, if we say each of these is about two and a half feet, We've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, almost 10. So we've got almost 20 feet of, uh, well, maybe a little over 20 feet. So about six or seven meters of sandstone full of shell. Where do we think, see things like that? Well, we see areas like this in tidal inlets, like in San Luis Pass in Galveston Bay, as a matter of fact. So San Luis Pass is a tidal inlet that's got a lot of shelly material. It's a big scour. There's sand, there's cross bedded dunes. Some of this organic material suggests tidal influence because you have lower energy cycles depositing that fine grain organic, then higher energy deposits of sand, then low energy, high energy, low energy, high energy. So these could be representing tidal cycles. On top of that tidal inlet, we flood it again. It's abandoned. We get back into a bay. So again, you picture uh, continuing subsidence here. We're in a subsiding basin anyway. So the tidal inlet compacts, gets taken down, and then we start prograding again. In other words, we start building up and we're going low energy down here to higher energy 
to burrows. This is again typical of a delta. Now this delta has a lot more burrowing than our friend down there, which suggests that it might have been more of an open coast delta. It might have had less fresh water coming in, or we might have just been sampling here a part of the delta that didn't have as much fresh water hitting it because deltas are asymmetrical bodies. But either way, we see that same transition from fine grain to coarser grained. And then right in here is another important deposit, this scour surface, which has rip up clasts. You can see it's ripped up chunks of organic material, which are actually bits of this reworked. But there's a scour. And that's where the cross bedding picks up. And in that cross bedding is where we find Ophiomorpha. So that scour and that cross bedding can form in a couple of environments. And we can argue about this all day. But what we know is it's high energy because it's got cross bedded sand, lots of oxygen and salt water because it's got Ophiomorpha. And this type of deposit is very common in upper shore faces or wave dominated deltaic bars, mouth bars. So since we've got a progradational pattern down here, in other words, sediments spewing out into the ocean, the ancient Wyoming Ocean, the Cretaceous Western Interior Sea, it makes sense that it would be deltaic wave dominated mouth bars sitting on top of the prograding deltaic front. So I'm going to interpret these as wave dominated, and I'm saying wave dominated because there's a lot of high energy, there's a lot of cross bedding. So just to recap, we've got a nice section of core here that seems to have a really interesting succession of two maybe river dominated deltas. They've got a lot of mud, a lot of silt. Uh, sand is not very burrowed. There's not a lot of marine organisms infiltrating this material after it's deposited. There's coal swamps. So we've got a delta building out into a coal swamp, delta building out into a coal swamp, and then we start getting some tidal inlets incising. So tidal inlets come in. They've got lots of shell, lots of organic material. The tidal inlets are finally abandoned. Then we start getting progradation of a high energy delta that's got a lot of burrowing. It's got a lot of ophiomorphic traces in it. And it's got the hallmarks of something that's more of a storm dominated delta, not a river dominated delta. So two river dominated deltas, a couple of tidal inlets, and maybe a storm wave dominated delta in this core succession. That's pretty cool. You can come up with different interpretations. That's fine as long as it's based on evidence, as long as it's based on appropriate analogs, and as long as you can support that interpretation. Hey, I'm all ears, and so is any geologist worth their salt. I hope you enjoyed this little walk through the core lab. Um, this is just one of the facets of looking at sedimentary geology, paleontology in the form of trace fossils and the fossils of the bivalves. Um, let me know what you think. Drop a comment below. As always, I will see you on the outcrop in the core lab or museum. And thanks for watching. I really appreciate it. Take it easy.